Why don't we stand as we begin to worship this morning? You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are. It's who you are. And I'm loved by you. It's who I am. It's who I am. It's who I am. Oh, 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 oh,
Today's reading comes from Isaiah chapter 53. Talking about Jesus that he was despised and rejected by mankind. A man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God. Stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds, we are healed. Father, we love you and we praise you in this place today. Thank you for taking the punishment that was rightfully ours. That's why we can continue to sing this morning. In this
Savior and our King. He's the great I am. He's all that is and all that ever was and all that ever will be. Lift your voices with us as we continue to worship.
are the great I am, and we celebrate that in this place today. Father, be glorified by the praises of your people. We love you and we praise you in this place. And everyone who is willing and agreed said. There are a lot of things that terrorists do not want us to know. We've been talking about these this summer. We come to number eight today. They, they do not want you to know that you're going to be judged by your God. They want you to be afraid of them and pay attention to them and not fear God. We've talked a lot about what terrorists do to try to get our attention. And remember a couple of weeks ago, I mentioned the terrorist who uh, blew himself up, except his vest didn't go off. So the suicide bomber, they were able to interview him. And one of the things that he said was, we're trying not just to kill people, but to instill fear in people who remain behind. Has that worked? Have they made you afraid? Are you afraid of the wrong things? We need to pay attention to what we're afraid of. And we need to be afraid of this. One day we will stand before the judgment seat of God. This is a healthy fear. There are fears that are healthy and fears that are unhealthy. What are you afraid of? Do you know, if you're afraid of medicine, it's called pharmacopoeia. If you're afraid of dust, it's called amathophobia. If you're afraid of otters, and I know many of you are, <laughs> it's called lyrophobia. There are people who are afraid of everything on the right side of their body. It's called decaphobia. If you're afraid of crossing the street, that's domophobia. If you're afraid of public, of crowds in public places, for example, like you can't go to First Monday in Canton, all right? It's just not, not going to happen. That's called agoraphobia. Now, if you're afraid of crowds anywhere, just large group of peoples, uh, that's called uh, demophobia. Now, it's important because, to remember the distinctions between demophobia, people everywhere, and act. You know what, that's really not important at all. <laughs> if you're afraid of beautiful women, it's called ventrophobia. Or if you're a man, we'll just call you stupid and move on. <laughs> if you're afraid of clocks, it's called chronophobia. If you're afraid of walking, it's called ambulophobia. If you're afraid of speed, it's called tachnophobia. If you are afraid of Satan, I'm not making this up, if you're afraid of Satan, the clinical term is Satanophobia. You could have guessed that one. If you're afraid of God, it's called the beginning of wisdom. The writer of Proverbs said, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning of wisdom for this reason. You're going to make better decisions more wise decisions in your life if you are afraid of your God than if you're not afraid of your God. Knowing that a holy, righteous, loving God will give an appraisal of your life at the end of your life should change how you live your life. Therefore, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. We're looking at a couple of scriptures today out of the book of Hebrews, uh, one in Hebrews 9, one in Hebrews 10. And they both talk about fearing God because he will be our righteous judge. Hebrews 9, 27 says, Just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment. And Hebrews 10, 31 says, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. We are afraid. We're afraid of a number of things and quite often... We are afraid of the wrong things. Jesus said to his followers, he said, do not be afraid of those who kill the body. Those are the wrong people to be afraid of. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Jesus had this understanding of God that was a complete understanding. He understood all of who God was. Now, when he came, the people understood very well what he was talking about here, of God of, as judge, and, and God was, he was holy and righteous and separated from them. So when Jesus came and began talking about things like uh, God is your Father, 
God is your Father who knows what you need before you even ask. That was news to them, and they loved it, and they picked up on it, and they ran with it. And, and we love those concepts of God, and we talk a lot about them, but we don't talk much about this aspect of God where Jesus said, be afraid of him. He's the one who can destroy both your soul and body in hell. We need to be afraid of the right things, not the wrong things. Terrorists want us to be afraid of the wrong things. You know they succeeded by getting us to be afraid of the wrong things in America with the attacks on 9-11. In 2001, after the trade centers went down, Americans were afraid of flying. That attack, of course, took place in September, which put it right before Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's. We travel a lot, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's. And in 2001, we wanted to be with family. We wanted to see family. We wanted to be assured that, that our family was doing all right. And so people still traveled to be with family following 9-11 in 2001. But so many Americans were afraid to fly because of what happened on September the 11th that they drove instead. This was not a good decision. The best research shows that an addition that 353 people died on the roads more than would have died if we had flown. Because we know intellectually that flying is safer than driving, and the most dangerous part of flying is driving to the airport, and we know this intellectually, but emotionally, you look at that giant piece of steel and, and all the people getting on it, and you say, really, we're going to go up in the air to 30,000 feet? This doesn't make sense, and it doesn't make sense, but it is safer than driving. And sometimes we're afraid of flying, not afraid of driving. We're afraid of the wrong things. Terrorists want you to be afraid of them instead of being afraid of your God. Jesus looked at the people around him and he said, you're afraid of those who can destroy the body. You need to quit being afraid of them. You need to be afraid of the one who can destroy your body and your soul in hell. We have to pay attention to who we're afraid of and we need to be afraid of God. We've been talking about not focusing on terrorists, and, and today we're taking a step above this. So what I've said prior this summer has led to this. Let's move up a notch today, and let's see that our focus should be on our fear of our God, our God who will someday be our judge. Hebrews 10.31 says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of of the living God. This presents God as someone who will judge, and he has presented himself as someone who will judge. He's never backed off from that facet of his personality. This is who he is in his core being. And it, it's important to know what someone is really made of and pay attention to that. Last Sunday, after we worshiped with you guys, Deanna and I made our way home. We had just gotten in the house. We're standing in the kitchen. And I'd noticed when I pulled in that my neighbors had returned from a vacation. Their garage door was up. And, and we're standing in the kitchen. And then I hear this noise from outside. I heard this crunching, cracking, breaking noise. And I thought, oh, my neighbors who've just returned home just backed into their own car in their driveway. Then I heard another crunching, crackling, breaking noise. And then our house shook. And I'm thinking, they backed into their car again and knocked something into our house? I, I don't know what this is. Deanna said, did you hear that? Yes, I did. Did you feel that? Yes. She said, what was it? Before I could tell her my theory on the neighbors, she decides to go out and find out what it is. And I've decided, since my neighbors just got home from vacation and have backed into their own car, I'm going to give them some alone time. Because <laughs> they're church-going people, and they may need to use some non-church words right now. 
but she goes out to check, and then she comes in and says, it's our fence, our fence is down. Sometimes something gets in your mind and you can't get it out even though it's not true. And I have it in my mind that my neighbor, this noise involves my neighbor's car, so I'm thinking, how did our neighbors drive into our fence? Because that logistically just isn't going to happen. Here's what happened. We have had a very large tree in our backyard. A branch broke off. This branch alone, when I say branch, you may be thinking branch. No, think branch. 12, 15 inches in diameter, over 30 feet long. I'm not exaggerating on this, okay? This is what came out of the tree. The first crackling noise I heard was the branch breaking loose from, just snapped. Not provoked, it just snapped out of the tree. Fell down, took out a section of my fence. Now, this is the only good news. All the land behind my fence is owned by the state of Texas, and they don't know or care what goes on back there. That's pretty obvious. Most of the branch is on their side, so I'm not going to have to deal with it. But some of the branch is on my side, and the tree is still there. So I called my tree guy. If you live in East Texas, you need a tree guy, right? And so Abel comes out, and he looks at it, and he smiles because he's seeing a pretty big job coming. And I said, look, all the land behind the fence, I don't care about. He said, oh, so I can just cut it off here and just leave it? I said, yep, just leave it. No one cares. Great. And then he looks at my tree, and he says, your tree is in trouble. This tree is over three feet in diameter, and it's within 10 feet of my house. And he says, I've seen trees like this fall and just split the house completely in half. There's an image you don't want. And then he says, you see this? And he starts pointing out all the various funguses and breaks. And, 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 and I'm thinking, killer tree. It's coming down. I knew a lot of little branches. Had come. Earlier this year, a branch fell and it spiked a hole in my root. I don't know if you know this, but if wood goes through a shingle and just spikes through, when it rains, the wood swells and immediately fills the hole. You can just leave it. <laughs> it was, well, it was there, what, two months? I don't know, before I had a guy come out and fix a little hole in the roof. So this tree's been attacking my house before. And I said, so, and he grins, and he says, you want to know how much? And he tells me how much. And I said, I was hoping it would be under $1,000. And then he smiles real big and he says, I've already given you the friend price. For anyone else, this would be, and this astronomical number came out of his mouth. I'm going to pay him to take the tree down, and here's why. I've taken a good close look at this tree. This tree is dying, and it is breaking apart and it is going to destroy my house. I know that about the nature of this tree. Here's what I want you to know about the nature of your God. He is holy, and he will judge your life one day. This is who he is. I am fortunate that the branch that broke off took out my fence, not my house. And so now I get to decide when this tree comes down and where it comes down, i.e. not on my house. You are fortunate that you get to decide how you live your life before you stand before your God. And knowing what he cares about and what he values, you need to live your life so you will not be terrified on that day when you find yourself before your God. And he is on his judgment seat, ready to judge your life. He is a judge. He has identified himself as such. Know that about him. We will be judged. Hebrews 10, 31 says, It is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
Jonathan Edwards preached a sermon years ago called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. It was in the early founding of our country. I'm thinking you couldn't preach that kind of sermon today. If, if I titled this sermon Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, there'd be people who would say, you shouldn't call people sinners, that's offensive. It is, but sin is offensive. Why can't we tell the truth? Sinners in the hands of an angry God? Oh, let's, produce, let's just present God as a, a kind God, a, a gentle God, a God who approves all and, and loves all. He does love all. And He loves us even in our sin. But He still hates sin. And it angers Him. And we need to capture some of these concepts again today and recognize that God will be our judge. Hebrews 9.27 says, people are destined to die once. We got, we've got that concept. We know that death is coming. But then he says, and after that, to face the judgment. We need to resurrect this idea that, that God is judge. And we need to allow him to put on the judge's robe and sit behind the judge's bench and hold the judge's gavel and allow him to be judge. That doesn't mean he's not loving father. That doesn't mean he's not compassionate friend. That doesn't mean he's not our helper. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about our struggles and problems. It just means he is also going to be our judge. And we cannot see him as one thing and not another. We all have different personas. We all have different ways that we uh, act in front of people and around people. And, and those things vary at different times in our life and even on different days of the week. And some days you look like people expect you to. Some days you don't. And so some days he looks like loving father and some days he doesn't. But we need to remember that he has never abdicated the judgment throne. So, what are people supposed to look like? What is a governor of the state of Texas supposed to look like? Years ago, a friend of mine that was working in Austin with a lobbying firm, and he was at work one Saturday, so he was at the state capitol, and this was a number of years ago, and he had his son with him, and he looked up, and uh, George W. Bush was governor of the state at that time, and he looked up, and the governor came out into the, the central lobby area where the people were. He was there on a Saturday and just happened to walk down the hallway. And my friend said, I cannot let this opportunity go by. I, my son has the chance to, to meet the governor. I'm going to make sure this happened. So he took his boy and he walked over. He introduced himself. And he looked at his son and he said, Seth, this is George W. Bush, who is the governor of the state of Texas. And governor Bush reached down to shake Seth's hand, smiled at him, and Seth looked at him and he said, you're the governor. Governor Bush said, yes, I am. And Seth said, I thought you'd be dressed nicer. This is why, as parents, we age so much. It, it was Saturday morning, he had on boots, blue jeans. I mean, you know Governor Bush. He, he's dressed like he'd like to be dressed all the time. He wanted to be at his ranch. He didn't want to be at the office. It's Saturday morning. No, he didn't look like the governor. And Seth was surprised by how he looked. I think there are going to be some people who, after they die, are going to be surprised at what their God looks like because he's going to look like a judge, and he has told us that. We, we have reduced him to the babe in swaddling clothes in the manger, and, and he is that. And we have reduced him to the carpenter, and, and he is that. We've reduced him to the teacher in the temple wearing the clothes of the common man, and he is that. But he is also the eternal judge. And he has not and he will not leave that throne. And when Jesus ascended from earth to heaven, he ascended to be seated at the right hand 
of the judgment seat, and that is where he is today. We must fear our God. I went to seminary so long ago that churches still held revivals. And the seminary actually held revivals each semester, and a preacher would come in and preach a revival. One year, Dr. Ken Chafin came to preach our revival. He was pastor at South Main Baptist Church in Houston at the time. And he said something about the idea we've talked about this morning that literally changed my life. He said, if you believe that one day you will stand before your God and give an account for how you have lived your life, then the day to start living as if you believe that is true is today, and it should change how you live your life. And from that day, I have cared so very little about what people think about me. And I care so very much about what my God thinks of me. Because your opinion of me may matter for this lifetime, but not beyond. But my God's opinion will change my eternity. And on the day when I stand before him, I will be willing to say, God, I disappointed your people on numerous occasions I don't ever want to have to say, and I disappointed you, because I want to hear him say, well done, good, faithful servant. Let's pray together.